Hello, everyone. Welcome to Real Guitar Live. I'm Thomas Michaud. You probably already knew that. I'm really happy to be here. I have uh, just saw some of the comments, and uh, Kevin says, I really look forward to Thursdays with Thomas. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I look forward to being here. And part of it is the challenge for me, because I'm looking over some of these questions, and Honestly, I'm not sure I'm going to answer them yet, but I'm going to give it my best shot. And sometimes I'll use the question to, to uh, give a, a, a bit of lesson that maybe is not exactly the answer to the question, but uh, it inspires me to, uh, to use my, my experience to impart some wisdom. So hopefully some wisdom. <laughs> I'm going to start with answering questions that have been pre-submitted, and then I'm going to go over to the chat and start answering your questions. Please, if you could, start your question with the word question, because there's comments, and I can't go fast enough and figure out which is a question is a comment. So I'll just be looking for the word question. Um, and I'll say that again for people who come in a little bit later. Uh, by the way, as usual, at the end, I will do a drawing for people who are members of my Real Guitar Success membership. That just means that they participate in uh, practice in guitar sessions where there's a session every day during the week, and they check it off. And at the end, we enter at the end of the month. People who have completed just 10 minutes on each of the sessions gets put in a drawing for a $50 Amazon gift card. So we we do that each month at the Real Guitar live session. Let me start with a few questions, and I'm, uh, please add, add questions anytime. Um, and if I'll glance every now and then and see if there's a question that's related to what I'm already talking about, because it might be good for me to answer it right then and there. Uh, and look, if anything, please, at any time, if you can't hear me or anything, please let me know, and I'll make sure and look. <laughs> every now and then, the technology doesn't go my way, but it uh, looks like it's working today. People are saying hi. Uh, good. You just, I'll, I'll make sure and look in the comments in case something goes wrong. Um, so to start with, uh, Shulamit uh, is obviously doing some improvising, and good for you. And she's doing my Spanish guitar course. So the first question is related to that. Is there a movable version of the flamenco scale? I teach the flamenco scale, uh, uh, the first position, so to speak, here in this part of the neck in the course. So, um, yes, of course, every scale could be movable. Uh, you have, to, if it uses an open string, you have to refinger it a bit. Um, with the flamenco scale, you can play some version of it all up and down the neck. Now, the course, that's beyond the scope of the course. Um, I intended in this course to introduce people to improvising using this flamenco scale to create a sound that's kind of not normal as far as country rock pop music and to expand a little bit of the horizons of, of the students. I, um, I may make, if there's enough interest, a, a second version of the course and, and start using scales up and down the neck. Now, I do want to say that the flamenco scale is a, is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, some people don't even recognize such a thing as a flamenco scale. It's, um, I normally use a scale in improvising in, in place of that called the Phrygian dominant. Um, I, it, that just means it's a Phrygian scale with one note changed to make it a dominant. It's the seventh note in the scale. I won't go into too much into theory unless somebody asks me a question specifically about the theory. So a Phrygian scale is one of the modes, just to give you some context, and you change the scale slightly by lowering the seventh degree um, to make it a Phrygian dominant. And I use that when I, basically it's the, the flamenco scale, and what I do is I, the other note that's in the flamenco scale, I consider that a an alternate spicy note. Just like in the pentatonic scale, the minor pentatonic, people call a blues scale. And there's all this debate where there's even such a thing as a blues scale. It's the minor pentatonic with the extra note, a blues note. Well, you could just say I'm playing the minor pentatonic and then add some embellishments. 
uh, and that's the blues note. Or you can say there's a blues scale and practice that separately. That's kind of how the flamenco scale works. So um, if you want to play up and down the neck, I, I would say um, first thing is probably make sure you spend enough time playing the basic version. <laughs> And if you want to play up and down the neck, just start expanding from where you're at and adding notes going in a different direction. Um, I did, I will make a link to the Phrygian Mama scale all up and down the neck, quite honestly, unless you're practicing everyday improvisation for, you know, some period of time, I wouldn't go up and down the neck. Um, I would, I would work what you can do in the first part of the scale and start trying to make good sounding improvisation instead of spending your time trying to learn the notes all up and down the neck. Uh, that's not making music really. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. <laughs> Let me answer the next question. Um, are there tracks uh, for the course? And again, she's talking about the Spanish guitar course. Can we download them as MP3s? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think I, I, put that in the course. Uh, I, I may in the future if I'm not asking for it, but it is going to take me time and um, I have lots of things to do, so it'll take away from doing something else. So unless there's a, a, a significant call for it, that people are going to be downloading it and improvising, um, I wouldn't want to spend the time there right now. But I'm open to it. Just, you know, let me know. People in the, doing the Spanish guitar course, let me know if that's something you want to do. And I'll consider it. But again, there's no, there's no free time. I just have to take away from something else and and put it there. Um, can I use the thumb instead of index and middle fingers for picking? Yes, um, I often use my index and middle fingers for picking single notes. I also use a pick, even on my nylon string guitar. It depends on what I'm playing and what the the effect that I want. So I've practiced both the first two fingers and the pick. But she's asking if you can actually use your thumb for playing melody. I was watching a video about, um, I was watching a video of Paco de Lucia playing guitar. And I was amazed at how fast he could use his thumb to play melody. And it gives a little different sound. It's like a punchier sound. So definitely, I don't do that a lot. I use the thumb more for like bass notes, but there obviously are people that are very good at that. Um, Next, what is the best way to learn and use exotic scales? And again, because I know she's doing the Spanish guitar course, I think she's talking about things like the Phrygian dominant scale as opposed to a major and minor scale. The best way to use any scale is to, first of all, practice one version of it separately. Then to play some type of simple backing track and play the scale along with it. Try to play it in time with the beat. Don't worry about improvising yet. Play the scale in time with the beat. And you can try different tempos to try and play it faster. What, what I like to do is play it very slow at first, but then double the time. So I'm not changing the tempo of the backing track. I'm just doing two notes instead of one. So that makes it twice as fast when I'm playing the scale over the backing track. So that's important. You're training your ear to hear how the notes fit with the backing track and to hear how the timing fits. Um, one of the biggest issues with improvising is timing. And first of all, you just want to be able to play the notes on the beat and then play two notes per beat before you start trying to play anything fancier than that. Then the third step is to start trying to make up phrases that you can play along with the backing track. And I'm still on just that first part of the scale. And then and it's not an exact line. In other words, you might want to go back and practice the scale again if you start getting confused and then practice phrases. And this is something that you do over and over. I basically recommend spending a certain amount of time regularly, every day is good, playing with backing tracks, starting warm up with a, the scale that you're going to be using, and then play the backing track that goes with that scale. and practice making phrases, try to remember ones you like, forget ones you didn't like, and then try to construct them into uh, some kind of solo. 
Uh, there's more advanced soloing techniques, but that is a lot right there. In other words, okay, I'll say it this way. I find it's human nature to want to mark what you've learned. And one way to do that is to mark the number of scales, the number of positions that you can play the scale, the, the same with chords and mark the number of chords. But most people make the, uh, a big mistake when learning is that they, they go for what they can measure, <laughs> number of scales, number of places you can play the scale, as opposed to using it in a way that's musical. Now, it, it's not wrong in a sense, it's just, it's human nature because it's, you know, it's, if you're just playing three notes and you're trying to make them musical, you have, it's hard to know if you're getting better and there's no objective measurement. You know, nobody's going to say, yeah, you finally got the rhythm and those notes just right. Um, but it still needs to be done. Playing numbers of positions on the neck and numbers of scales and different scales doesn't actually make music. It's a intellectual, physical intellectual exercise. It's meant to supplement making music and to expand your horizons. But because we want something we can measure, we often get stuck there. The solution to that is spend time playing very little amounts of scales, but trying to make music and less time expanding the scale and learning different scales and different positions on the neck. Spend more time playing one simple scale and making up little phrases and doing with backing tracks. I think a, a, if you really want to improvise, spend an hour a day playing with a backing track, just making up music and spend 20 minutes of that. This is just off the wall guess. 20, okay, 40 minutes of improvising and 20 minutes of practicing the scale that you're going to be using and improvising and maybe some specific licks or rhythms or exercises to improve your timing and rhythm kind of thing. So, but, and, and I'm susceptible to this too. I, I notice in my practice, it's easier on one sense for me to practice um, something tangible, a scale at a certain speed, because I can measure it and say, yeah, I got a little faster there, or I, I can play these four scales, I couldn't play them last week. But it never quite turns into music unless you do what I'm suggesting, actually use it and play it. There's so many subtleties. Backing tracks are a good way to do that. If you can play with live people, that's sort of the next level. But I think I'd say backing tracks are about 80% of the way there. With live people, there's pros and cons. One is the play with light people to give you energy, you know, the expressions and the little nuances and some of the feedback. It gives you energy to improvise. You can play for hours um, improvising with uh, a band. At the, on the other side, there's, they change on you. <laughs> so they speed up, slow down, play something different. So with backing, the backing tracks, you got more predictability. And of course, it's more accept, it's accessible. Playing with backing tracks is a lot easier than to find a group of musicians that you can play with regularly. Okay, so that's my lesson on that. Let me go on to the next question. What is a triad and how do we use them? So first of all, a triad is just simply a chord. It's three notes. Triad means three. And it defines a chord. Uh, the three notes define a chord. And depending on the three notes, or I should say the distance between the three notes, it's a major, minor chord, a diminished, half diminished. No, I'm sorry, diminished or augmented. There's no half diminished with three notes. Uh, I'm going to take that back. I, I, I realize I could do make a half diminished with three notes. Okay. Three notes means triad, major, minor, augmented, diminished. It's the way we usually define them. The way you use them uh, partly is, is to understand more elaborate chords as the foundation, because when you're making a... Um, let's say a minor seventh chord, the seventh means there's a fourth note. There are rules that you can omit some of the notes, so it doesn't have to be four notes. But the idea is you have the triad plus an extra note, the seventh note. And understanding triads helps you to understand and be able to create all across the neck other types of chords as well. You need that foundation. But also I use triads as part of my improvisation. In other words, I'll, I'll play scale-wise type motion phrases that are 
often scale-wise, but then I want to make leaps between notes, and sometimes the leaps are correspondent with the chord that's being played, and I use a triad. So it's only playing an A chord, I might play up a triad, three notes. Oops. Those three. <laughs> there we are, three notes. That's a chord. That's an arpeggio, one note at a time. Um, and learning triads gives you the ability to move up and down the neck in chord, uh, chord-wide movement as opposed to scale-wise. In other words, the leaps that involve the intervals of chords, from the root of the chord to the third of the chord to the fifth of the chord, and so on, as opposed to just going up and down the scale. Uh, and it's a good way to practice. I, I integrate the two when I'm improvising. Can you go over the difference of the minor and major pentatonic scale, please? This is uh, Rogelio. Okay, the pentatonic means five note scales. The major pentatonic, I'll take a C, is one step, five notes, one, two, three, four, five, five, <laughs> and then repeats, that's the octave. Major pentatonic, second, third, out of the major scale, let's say uh, C major scale, the second, the third, fifth, sixth, sixth, <laughs> and root. Has that major sound, a kind of a simplified major sound, particularly good in country music, in, in rock, in the kind of rock that has more of a uh, uplifting pop rock feel as opposed to the bluesy type rock. Minor pentatonic is root. It, out of the minor scale, it's the root, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and back to the root there. Five notes again. Major, minor. And use more for bluesy type rock. It gives that kind of minor -y sound. I threw in a blues note. Blues note right there. Uh, maybe more common in rock, that 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 kind of bluesy sound. Uh, a lot of rock comes more from bluesy roots. Um, let's go on to the next question. Are the pentatonic scales used for chord progressions? So, Rogelio, if you're on the call, I'm not exactly sure what that means. I'm going to give it a shot, but I might be off base here what you're actually asking. So, uh, often, if, if I'm playing rock or country music, I'll use a minor pentatonic scale or a major pentatonic scale. If it's a major type progression, um, probably a major pentatonic, and if it's more of a bluesy sound, um, the minor pentatonic. Um, and yes, I would play the scale over the whole progression, as opposed to a, a more jazzy approach where you'd play a scale that goes with the chord that you're on. Um, and that's very common in rock, especially, to play, you know, a, a minor pentatonic scale over the whole thing and to play it through the whole solo. I think that's what you're asking, but please let me know if, if I got it. And I saw he says he's here today, but no, um, no additional information yet. Next, Kevin's asking if he's he's wondering if there's a lesson on figuring out on figuring out finger picking notes for a song. Uh, so I believe what you're saying is so you can play a song finger style. In other words, play the chords and melody together with your fingers. Um, <laughs> like that. I just made something up off the fly there. Um, I'm thinking the first step would be to determine what the chords are. So let's, uh, let me see how I'm going to answer that question. Um, first of all, yes, I did create a lesson on that. And I created a step-by-step a -step lesson to systematize it. But in reality, it's not that neat and clean. <laughs> it's just you need a place to start and then you kind of got the steps and you work with it. In other words, 
when I'm playing a fingerstyle song, I don't always start with the chords or I don't always start with the melody. One or the other, likely. Often I would start with the melody. So let's say I want this one. I play a simple melody and I make sure I got that melody clear in my mind. So that's what I'm after. Now I'm going to see what chords go with that melody. I know I'm in the key of C. I could, I could tell just by the sound that's in the key of C. But if I look, that's a C scale. Intellectually, I could say, yeah, it's a C scale. But I, I, you all, when you do that enough, you start being able to hear. I'm in a major sound. That's a C major. And that's the root, major. So I'm going to start with a C chord. So I'm going to try and play the chords. So I'll often, I'm not very good at singing, but I'm, I can do sing well enough to sing the notes. But sometimes I'll play the melody on a recording so I don't have to worry about the singing part. In other words, I don't have to even put any energy there. So I'll sing now because I don't, don't want to take away and record. Um, da, 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 da. Now I need another chord for the next part. Da, da, da. Okay. That sounds like an easy one. Da, da, da. Da, 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 da. Da, expanding on my melody okay and if you're trying to play a song that somebody else wrote you'd basically do the same thing you'd figure out the melody maybe play the melody on, on the guitar on a recording and then play try to find the chords that go with it if i were playing a song let's say a simple song silent night i would probably go and find the sheet music and find out what chords they're using and not just try to figure it out on the fly that would be an easy one. It's only three chords, Silent Night. Let me see. So, na, da, da, da. Just trying to get the chords. Back to the home. So if I were just learning this, I'd go find the sheet music. You can see in the key of C, it's got C, F, and G. So I'm not going to have to just figure that out from, from thin air. So once I got that, I'd probably make up a finger picking pattern basically. It's very simple, as simple as I could. Uh, oh, I know what I do. No. Instead of a finger picking bang first, I would just try to play the bass note and the melody. Okay, do that note. Now I need. See what I'm doing? I'm just playing the bass note of the chord with the melody, and I'm using my thumb for the bass note and my fingers for the melody. That gives me the foundation. Then I'd start adding more notes to make it sound more like a some kind of picking pattern. I'm combining a simple picking. Ah, here we go. figuring this out on the fly right now um and of course i go back and forth a little bit i get off on the melody this is where it helps to have the recorded melodies you can play the chords along with it play a finger picking pattern just see the thing is i don't um i can't always play a complete finger picking pattern and, and play the melody at the same time so that's why i prefer to play the bass note and the melody first and then add some additional notes and see what fits in between those notes 
Now, I, I do have a lesson on this. I think that's roughly the, the order I went in. Sometimes, honestly, I'll, um, uh, if I'm figuring out a song uh, for finger picking style, I'll find the chords first, and then I'll go in trying to sing the melody along with the chords. That's if I don't know the chords. If it's a, a standard song, I'll, I'll go look up the chords. I'm not going to just figure it out if I don't have to. I'd save time. Let's see. Next question. So let me know if you have any more questions about that, Kevin, if you're on the call. Um, often, when I'm talking like that, it brings up other questions or other issues related. I'm happy to expand on that. How can I create a Rick... Uh, Rick. Lick or riff. That Rick was a combination of lick and riff together. <laughs> I like that. How can I create a lick or riff for a given chord progression? For example, uh, this is Jalma. Uh, let's say I have A minor, D minor, and yeah, it's a one, four, five. So let me see. Um, I don't normally like create licks or riffs. I'll create, create when I'm improvising phrases that I like. I, I guess you could call them licks or riff, depending, you know, how long. Often I practice, uh, or not, not so much anymore, but I start off practicing licks and riffs that I heard other people playing. So it wasn't a matter of figuring out a lick or riff that goes with the progression. I was listening to somebody and imitating them, and then I would try to integrate that into my own playing. But if I were making a uh, riff up for this chord progression, one, four, five in the minor, I would start with the minor scale. The it's a, in the key of A minor. Let's I, I want to. I've got the minor pentatonic here. That will work over this. I would play the progression on a uh, and record it, so and then play along with it. I'd play the A minor scale. If I if I hadn't done that in the past, I would play the scale just like I said. I would start with just playing the scale along with the backing track, trying to get it in time. Then I start creating phrases. You could call them licks. A simple phrase, three notes. to add, make fancier, I'd start adding slide or, or bends or, uh, yeah, slide sound good there, or uh, uh, hammer and pull offs. Something like that. Um, I, I don't know if I were really into this, I might record some of my licks so I remember them, the ones I like. Then I could go at some practice session, maybe once or twice a week, play my licks and play through them and try to add to my little library of licks that I was working on. Uh, I would stay with one key for a while until I felt like I'd kind of really done that and then go on to another key rather than, you know, changing keys constantly and never remembering what I actually came up with that I liked. Sounds like a fun practice to me. I, I hope that helps, Jama. Let's see. Please explain the use of looping pedals. I uh, and and Michael says I watch Ed Sheeran on Amazon Music. And he asks things like how many pedals are needed. I'll I'll, um, I'll answer each of these questions. So the basic idea of looping pedals. First of all, let me say I I saw Ed Sheeran live, uh, he, and I was. I was amazed. First of all, I was just amazed that the place was a big, um, you know, football stadium or indoor stadium, huge here in uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and it was packed with Ed Sheeran playing by himself and a looping pedal. <laughs> now, I I was expecting a whole band, I, and quite frankly, I liked the band because I like seeing all the musicians. I like watching the bass player, the drum, 
and all that. But I was amazed he could do that. He can fill a stadium with just himself. Imagine um, how, how much easier it is to travel, to set up, um, less people to pay, less people to, to flake out, <laughs> to you know, not come to practice or whatever. Uh, if you're playing the band, you know how many things can go wrong. Anyway, um, yes, he used the looping pedal. I, I couldn't actually see what he was doing on the looping pedal, but he had some stuff pre-recorded. I could tell that because he played it and it played very fancy stuff. So I haven't seen the Amazon Music thing, but uh, it sounds like I should watch that. Um, that sounds interesting. The looping pedal basically is a digital recorder and it records constantly. So you can play something, let's say like a chord progression. turn it off and it'll play that over and over the rhythm pedal it'll just keep playing what you just that little bit the phrase that you played over and over and over in a looping fashion ha, hence the name clever um a lot of times the simplest way to use a looping pedal is to play a chord progression like i just did stop in other words grab that portion have it play over and over then you could improvise on it So on. Fun. Great fun. Like having two guitar players in the room, only you get to tell the other guitar player exactly what to do all the time. <laughs> cool. Um, what Ed Sheeran did was, you know, took it up many notches. He's got pre-recordings on there. I'm not, and it sounds like several instruments. And so it's just, you know, more elaborate versions of digital recordings. And he is triggering them and then playing along with them, singing or playing his guitar and singing. But he'll have other instruments and other guitar parts already recorded on there. A lot of, I've had friends that perform uh, regularly live, and I do this occasionally, but not too often, where they'll use a looping pedal and they'll just play a chord progression and then play the melody over it. Or they'll play a chord progression and sing along, and then they'll hit, um, they'll play the chord progression and, and record it, and then they'll do their solo over it and then go back to singing and playing. I, I think it's cool. It's, it, of course, it takes practice, and like anything else, there's the practicing using looping pedal and practice the actual performance part of it. Um, how many pedals are needed for a simple three chord song? Uh, just one. The looping pedal can record many parts. One pedal can record many parts. Now, there are many different kinds of looping pedals to very simple, to very elaborate. The elaborate ones, you can record, it has several pedals on it, so you can record several parts and then trigger the different parts with a different pedal. So you can say, I'm gonna play the verse of the song with one part, and then play the chorus of the song, and when I want the verse, I hit one pedal, and when I want the chorus, I hit another pedal. Or, you know, you, usually I think, I've only seen up to five pedals, most of them only have one or two. So you're not gonna, have a different pedal for every song that you need what 20 pedals that wouldn't work um and then he asked if you can play rhythm chord changes and more a lot of the looping pedals have a little built-in drummer i never use that but i know my pedal that i have has a built-in drummer it just sounds cheesy to me but i know there are better pedals too that have better drummers built in I stick to pretty much just playing rhythm, melody, and I like to play harmony over my melody or several other guitar parts. Um, I have occasionally played my bass guitar and added a bass in there as well, or a rhythm part. I'll, I'll catch a, a, a shaker and say, choo, 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 say that, and then it plays, choo, 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 and plays along with it. That's kind of fun, and it's a real shaker. So it sounds good, it sounds like a real shaker. Um, are there single pedals and a group of two to five available. I think what you might see Ed Sheeran using is a pedal that has several triggers on it, or pedals on it, they're triggers. So we can record different parts and then press the trigger. Uh, I've seen elaborate ones that you can record dozens and dozens of parts and then you change the dials and say, I want part, I want to play song number 16 and then it'll give you the parts for that song. Um, mine, the one I use is more simpler than that, but I know you you can get very elaborate. Um, you don't need a bunch of pedals, separate pedals. But one of the things that I have bought for my pedal is you can get, for the boss pedal, you can get a separate 
foot pedal. So the boss pedal is just one little pedal with one foot switch, but you can get extra foot switches. That's what I'm trying to say. So that you can record different parts and then trigger them with the uh, supplemental foot switches. I liked having just two extra foot switches. One is to start to play the loop and one is to, re to record the loop because to me, it's a little extra work to use one pedal to stop and start and stop and start and play. I get, it's a little confusing sometimes. It's just faster and smoother to have separate pedals for stop and play and record and play rather. Um, can you demonstrate a simple song? Actually, I would have to set up and I, I wouldn't want to do that right now, um, but I did record a video uh, earlier, uh, about a year ago actually, using my looping pedal and showing how I put together a simple song starting with chords. I think I play a little bass part on my guitar and so on. I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes so you can see uh, a very organized demonstration of using the looping pedal to create a fairly simple song. Well, beyond three chords, I, I added chords. I'd like to add a little bass line with my guitar, a little harmony part to the melody and so on. It's a lot of fun. I, I really recommend it. And it seems like for what they cost, you get a lot more enjoyment out of it than the money that you have to pay. And I would start simple. You can always you know, expand later, but even a you know, $100 foot pedal nowadays can get you a lot. I've seen some as low as $40, $50. I don't know the, the, you know, the differences what you get for 100 and I've seen them up to three, 400 too. Okay, fun to talk about that. Let me go on to the pre-recorded. We've completed the, the uh, pre-submitted uh, questions and I'm going on to the, the questions on the fly. Let me start with the top. I'm looking for the word question. Get my glasses focused here. As soon as I see a question, I put my uh, arrow over it, it disappears. So, um, ah, Rogelio says he's in the second adventure of the Spanish guitar course and really enjoying it. I'm glad to hear that, Rogelio. Uh, Let's see, question, question. Oh, there we go. Question. How do you count a measure when you arpeggiate a chord rather than just a strum? Using 4-4 four, four as an example. In the strum AC chord, strokes then arpeggio the same chord. Uh, Dan, I'm going to do my best shot, but I don't really understand that last sentence. But I get how do you count an arpeggio and 4-4 four, four time that I can I can talk about. Um, so let's say I'm doing an arpeggio. Arpeggio, by the way, again, for everybody, is a, just a chord, but one note at a time. And often you just finger the chord and play one note at a time. You can also, I can do this. In other words, I practice arpeggios that are broken up like that for, for playing solos, but it's very common for to play this as a, a rhythm pattern. Arpeggios, 50s rock and roll ballad style. So I would just count um, in this arpeggio, it's, it's going to be two notes per beat, one and two and one and two and. So the count is, I'd say one, two, three and four and one and two and one and two and one and two, three and four. I, I forgot three and four, huh? One and two and three. four is a common one for pop rock type ballads and arpeggios um that's all i can think to say about that right now i mean there are arpeggios that you would count uh break it up into four one two three four one what i usually use one e and uh, two e and uh, one e and uh, two e and uh, one e and uh, two e and uh, 
that's how I, I count uh, four um, individual notes for one beat. One beat, one E and uh, two E and, and so on. Mm, okay, I can't think of any more to say about that. Let me move on and feel free to ask more questions, Dan. Let's see, question, question, question. Oh, Lady Who Cares says, Spanish Guitar Course is echo. I'm getting advertisement for the Spanish Guitar Course. Thank you. Um, and by the way, for those who came in late, please start your question with the word question. There's a lot of comments, and I can't really sort out quickly the comments from the question. So I'm just looking for the word question. Uh, every now and then, another word gets my attention. But... Um, uh, Lady Who Cares says, I see she, I practice, I have a $50 mini looper. It stores nine loops. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, okay, Dan says that helps. I'm trying to play a simple song by arpeggio rather than just a strumming approach. Yes, that's a great, that's a fun thing to do. I mean, it really adds to your repertoire of how, what you can do with a song by adding some arpeggio patterns. And the simplest one is uh, to just do like the first one I did is one and two and one and two and. I would certainly start there because everything kind of builds on that if you want to do something different or fancier. Another one, and uh, Dan, I know you're in my Real Guitar Success. In December, I'm going to do House of the Rising Sun and I do uh, uh, interesting arpeggio pattern there. Look for that. And I really strongly recommend that you do that. It's So I'm doing a strum and an arpeggio. Strum on the way down and arpeggio on the way up. That's a fun one to add to you. Oh, and of course more in the lesson on how to count that. Okay, so I'm at the end. I don't see any more questions. I'm going to do the drawing and if you think of a question while I'm doing the drawing, please add it. I'll check again before we close up for today and answer any last minute questions. <coughs> the drawing, I need my other hat, <laughs> my tan hat, as opposed to the gray hat. Uh, okay, I will look. And again, for anybody who came in late, these are people who are in the Real Guitar Success program. I ask that you do 10 minutes on the guitar session each day uh, you can save it in your favorites if you want to spend more time on it later, but check it off after 10 minutes and that way you can get in the drawing and you're exposed to a variety of different techniques. By the way, you're going to find out uh, this month that I've changed up the guitar sessions a little bit, that I'm starting to do in a week a whole pattern, a whole song, or a, a whole theme. So I'll do a, a, a different lesson each day until you get to the end and you put them all together and either play a song. I'm including improvisation lessons in that every week, and I'm also adding different types of exercises. So I'm trying to up my game, and I'm spending more time at it. I, I would love to hear your feedback as you start going through the lessons for November. So with that said, back to the drawing. And for this week, we've got Paul. Good job, Paul. You got it. Send you a $50 gift card. And everybody, thank you for playing along. It's really... It's a game for me. It's just fun to add something to the whole practice regimen. In any case, the real gift is having fun with your guitar and getting better so you can have more fun. I'm going to check any last minute questions. Yes, I see one. I haven't played in years. Where do you suggest I start without starting as a beginner? Okay, so... Um, RV. Uh, probably, if, if I were starting uh, after not playing for years, I would want to do a review. I would kind of want to find out, you know, where I'm at. And so I would probably do a review. I would just get a beginning guitar course and just go through it and see what, what I know is easy and go brush through that and what I don't know. Often I find there's two issues that people struggle between. One is learning something, getting bored of it, moving on to the next thing before they really got it. Um, and, you, and the other side of that is staying on one thing until you feel like it's perfect, which then you never get anywhere. Both are a problem because if, if you move on too quickly, you 
you quickly get to a place where you're saturated and you can't, you don't have the, enough foundation to move on to more advanced stuff, which gets boring. And that's what people often call a guitar rut. The other side of that though is you, it's very frustrating. You never get anywhere if you try and get anything perfect. I, I use something called the 80% rule. Just go through a beginning guitar course and see if you feel like you can do that 80% of the way there. And if you can, move on to the next thing as fast as you can. And that way you kind of flush out where your weaknesses and strengths are and, and consolidate things together. Then when you get to a place where you feel like you have a good foundation, start building from there. And then it depends on your interest and what styles of music you want to play. Obviously, different styles require different things. Probably going to want to have a good foundation in changing and switching chords uh, smoothly and easily, as well as um, some facility with basic techniques. But beyond that, then it depends on the style and the particular types of things, finger picking style, chords and melody. Maybe you want to play rock, improvise, or a little bit of all of these things. And then, of course, you would go ahead and start moving, depending. If you're improvising, you definitely want to be playing some scales and start practicing the chord progression and improvising along with that. If finger style, then you want to take simple finger style songs that are just too hard to play, but not terribly too hard, but you know, not too easy. You've, in the beginning, of course, hopefully you've gotten some basic finger style stuff that you can do and then start building on that progressively. Uh, in my Real Guitar Success program, what I do is I give practice sessions each day that you can play and decide if this is in your level or if it's something you're interested in. If not, you just move on. If it is, you can save it in your favorites. And then you have a whole, over time, you get a list of things that you want to work on. And can, Pull those out at each practice session. Okay, uh, you're welcome, RV. I, I'm glad I could help. Um, I think I got all the questions for today. Thank you again for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing all of you next month, first Thursday of each month. Um, and if you're not a member of Real Guitar Success, I do offer a 14-day free trial please feel free to give it a try and ask me questions during that 14 days. I'd be happy to give you some feedback and try to guide you in the right way. If you're a brand new beginner, the beginner guitar um, adventure is a good way to just start and get a beginner, or if you want a quick review. But there are Barker courses, there's courses in finger style, and then of course the practice sessions have something new every day. I look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks again for joining me. Bye for now.